I All right, welcome. I'll move closer. For those of you who are in this same room for the last discussion, I promise it will not be the same discussion because <laughs> um, it looks like that on the paper. <laughs> um, so this is not 201. It is going to be actually a larger dialogue. So it was, I thought that was actually a very good discussion about the IANA function, and, and just, I'm sure Roger's out there and can still talk to you about it uh, if you want to go in the hallway. Actually, I can see him. Yep, he's talking about it right now. <laughs> um, so we are not going to do opening remarks. The bios of your speakers are in your um, well, on the web, and they're also in your your group and we're just gonna, I just I think we're gonna have a good discussion here about the larger issues of which the IANA function actually kind of brings to light a little bit which is we've got this amazing medium of the internet but it's starting as it's growing to kind of have some overreach uh, issues as to how different governments want to manage this how different constituencies want this managed and so we have a really good cross-functional panel today of people that represent uh, this through either our government um, through the work that they've done with their their think tank or association, and as well as um, uh, you know, Sally with um, c with civil society and the inter and the um, uh, internet society, which is doing this uh, all over the globe, and uh, Rick, who is doing this on behalf of his company, but has been in this space for a long time. So we'll just get started now. Um, actually, Jim Lewis, I'm going to start with you. That's what I get for having this out. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a BlackBerry? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Don't ask me um, about Android. There's, <laughs> I'm sure there's a cybersecurity reason. Um, Jim, you have been recently traveling to China and India, so I'm really interested in the perspective of the governments that you have been recently talking to and how they see some of these issues that are currently on our, our table about things like uh, Internet governance. Well, um, and a, a good way to think about it is that one of the goals that people have had is to spread the internet globally and serve a, a global population. And when you get these different um, uh, people in, the, the internet is basically moving from being a, a largely transatlantic uh, entity where you had, uh, or cy whatever you want to call it, cyberspace, where you had agreement on general principles, largely agreement, to one that's more global, where you have very different cultures, very different political systems. And it's not fair at all to say the Indians and the Chinese are in the same place, except on some issues. So if you, one of the questions I ask them is, when we say um, things like multi-stakeholder or free and open, what is it you hear? And what they, what they hear is hegemony, right? And so their question is, okay, how do we get a role in this thing? How do we make it more like something that we feel comfortable working with? And that's not the current system. Just to end real quick, the, the way we think about Internet governance now is largely an artifact of the 1990s. It was an experiment, a political experiment, and it needs to be modified to meet the expectations of a global population. So I think that's what I hear from them. I also hear about how it's all wicked American plot, but I usually ignore that. <laughs> well, I also think that Sony was brilliant the way they came out with that entire marketing ploy for that terrible movie. That was really awesome. But that's, you know, some of us believe in conspiracy theories. <laughs> Uh, John Carr, for someone who's done, who's been in this space as it has grown into a, a global medium, but have ma have looked at this through the eyes of you know the, the ITU, and a lot of times in this space is a bogeyman, but we also know they do a lot of good work in standards and other organizations, especially that you work with on child online protection. Yeah. Um, can you kind of comment on on where you see there have been cooperative efforts? Yeah, just so to be clear, I'm not an employee of the uh, United Nations or the ITU. I work with them for. Uh, children's organizations uh, around the world. Uh, I did have a technical background originally. Um, and uh, I work with the ITU specifically around its child online protection initiative. And um, part of the reason for that is, and I want to pick up on a point that Jim was just making, because I think there's some r resonance there. Uh, one of the reasons why the, the, the COP initiative that the, the ITU has initiated is so great, in my view, is because the UN can get you into places that, frankly, the British government and the American government, and we're just seen, by the way, normally as Americans in short trousers, or the, or the, <laughs> the 51st state, and you can thank the war in Iraq and amongst many other things for that, but, uh, but the, those problems simply don't present when you go wearing your hat as a UN uh, representative or as a, uh, as a UN initiative. Um, and that makes it, my work at any rate, a lot easier, particularly in Africa and parts of Asia and so on. But uh, just as um, 
uh, Jim, the, the last speaker, was making this point about the shared cultural and political assumptions which existed essentially on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean as the internet emerged. I think there was another. Uh, I think there was another dimension to that. I think if you were to ask anybody round about then who was the typical internet user that they had in mind, who they were addressing, um, it was probably a white male adult. Um, probably working in a university or a scientific research institute of some kind, and fundamentally that didn't, that idea didn't change. I think at that point in time, in the mid mid late 90s, uh, in most European countries and the United States, legal minors were maybe one fifth of the population of each country as a whole, and the proportion of, of internet users in that country was maybe slightly more than, than a fifth, because they were disproportionately more involved in using the technology than, than adults were. In, in the countries where the largest growth in the internet is going to take place in the forthcoming period, Legal minors are already 50% of the population in those countries and therefore will be su substantially more than 50% of the users in those countries. And yet, if you were to look around the different uh, bits of internet governance uh, institutions that exist, you would be very, very hard pressed to find any of them that acknowledge or embrace the, the fact that the population of the internet user is changing in that way and then specifically that it's changing to uh, lead us to a point where a very large proportion of internet users, in, certainly in particular jurisdictions, but also globally, are going to be legal minors. It's always almost as if it's an irritating and uh, a detail that nobody really wants to concern itself with. It's just It just doesn't feature. So part of my job is to try and change that and by, by speaking at events like this. Great. Chris, uh, you represent us globally, and I realize that internet governance is just kind of an overflow into the portfolio of a lot of the work you're doing in cyber. Do you hear about these discussions, or is cyber really kind of its own topic, and how are we manage that as, as a, managing that um, as part of a larger government dialogue? So no, I mean, I think this is, this is intertwined into all of these discussions about cyber, whatever, however you define cyber, and really, I think we defined it in our international strategy for cyberspace that President Obama released back in 2011 that talked about everything from internet freedom and, and the free flow of information to governance issues and the multi-stakeholder system to cybercrime, cybersecurity, international security and capacity building. So all of them are interrelated but they are still separate and I think there's been a tendency to think uh, an increasing tendency to use internet governance as a proxy for everything in cyberspace. And sometimes that makes sense and sometimes it doesn't, but you have to really keep your, you know, uh, keep focused on what we're trying to achieve in each of these areas and how we can achieve it so we're not uh, having a, uh, a, we're having a positive effect on the other areas and not a deleterious one. So, you know, one of the challenges I also see, and just going back to Jim's point too, is that one of the challenges we're facing, to give you an example, in the internet governance space is uh, governments who are not comfortable with a multi-stakeholder system, which I know Jim thinks is antiquated, but I actually think does, in fact, serve the world's interest in terms of having all these stakeholders together. But there are some governments who I think just don't understand how that works and how to play in it, and I think those are the governments we really need to work with uh, in this space. And there are other governments who are more repressive who are quite frankly worried about the free flow of information. They're using the idea of state control of the internet as a proxy to control that information. So then you have the human rights dimension and the governance uh, dimension come together. You have states that talk about the concept of cybersecurity, <coughs> but what, again, they're really worried about is destabilizing speech. And so then you have the security element come together. And increasingly in these conversations that are happening around the world, all of these issues come up. So, uh, yes, when you talk in the ICANN forum, uh, for instance, it's my, very much about the technical running of the Internet. But when you talk about in almost any other forum, you have a range of stakeholders. Sometimes you have specific communities, the security community, the economic community, the human rights community, uh, and they need to come together and they need to cross-pollinate those discussions. So to give you an example, um, you know, there, there's a number of things on the horizon this year, and there's been a number of things that happen all the time that, that uh, me, my colleague uh, Danny Sepulveda, uh, Larry Strickling, others uh, in our government have been uh, very heavily involved in. Uh, certainly the Net Monday All Conference in Brazil brought together all these different aspects of cyberspace and, and I think really helped advance the ball by getting uh, the Global South to understand the importance of the system and this multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, but I also think we have to be clear that uh, 
you know, there are different, governments have different roles depending on what topic you're, you're discussing. So the technical running of the internet, governments uh, may not be having the leading role. It should be the technical community and other stakeholders, but governments have a role, certainly. But when we're talking about cybercrime, for instance, governments pass legislation. They have a primary role, but you should have other stakeholders, stakeholders involved. And I think we can be more precise when we talk about these topics. Just to give you an idea of some of the things that are coming up, I mean, obviously, we have the Internet Governance Forum that's going to be hosted in Brazil this year. That brings together, that's an open platform for discussion, not just of governance issues, which you know, the name implies, but also of human rights issues, security issues, really the whole ball of wax. And it's important to have all those stakeholders come together. Uh, the Dutch are hosting uh, a conference, international conference on cyberspace. It's the fourth in the, the line, started in London with the Hague conference. Foreign Minister Hague then started this. Uh, and then it was in Hungary and then Seoul, Korea last year. And the unique part of this conference is it deals with a wide range, right, range of issues, but it also brings uh, civil society, the private sector, and governments together uh, and a range of different actors in those areas. And so that's very, uh, I think, a very good and robust conversation. And this year, I expect the real focus of that will be capacity building. And capacity building is an important effort that I think really gets that vast middle of the world that's still trying to figure out where they are in this space to, to see why an open internet, a multi-stakeholder system, having strong laws in place is important for cybercrime and dealing with threats and balancing all those things is important. And of course, we have the uh, WISIS Plus 10 review, which you know, it, it, it really can focus on ICTs and development and, and look at really reviewing uh, where the progress has been made in the action lines in the last 10 years. And, and really focusing on uh, continuing practical implementation measures to meet those outcomes. So there's a number of things, and those, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I often say there are so many cyber summits and meetings that it's like the cyber Alps or the cyber Himalayas. There's, they're, they're everywhere, but they're important to have them, and they're important for us as all of our stakeholders to plug into them and to really be engaged because things are getting decided or discussed in these forums by different communities, and we need to bring that together. Right. Sally, as someone who had a similar role to what Chris has been doing and spent a lot of time in Geneva, but now you get to be in Ghana, um, and or places where a lot of this actually is kind of where the it actually it becomes actionable. Can you kind of talk to us about how this pro these processes are going forward and is it working? Are we having the right dialogues at the right level? Sure. I, I is this this is working. I think you just have to get close to that one. Uh, it's it's an important question. I think the the discussion um, and a, a point was made on the previous panel that uh, we we often and I think in the United States have a, a very robust discussion about cyber issues, about internet issues, um, but we need to be very mindful of the next billion users, as they say, that are coming online, and those users have expectations of the network. They have um, expectations of the experience, of their own culture, of their own um, uh, ways of interacting with the technology that are going to change the internet. Then, as a result, they will change how the governance of the internet operates. Um, as in any good ecosystem, evolution is important. Things need to be able to grow. They need to be able to evolve to accommodate the new environment. Um, and so I think the internet ecosystem is importantly evolving as well. And you can look back um, to 2003, even 2005, uh, when this really hit the global stage and see an evolution that's important to recognize. You see an evolution at the UN level with a recognition of, of more stakeholders and trying to work through how to involve more people. You see it at the technical level. The discussion on the last panel is happening elsewhere in the internet ecosystem. How do you include uh, more uh, communities and importantly among those communities are really um, developing countries that are just coming online that need to be heard and that need to um, have a way of buying into um, this multi-stakeholder process. The word doesn't translate into multiple languages um, and so in some ways it's important to think about what do we actually mean by the term? It's not a religion. It's not a, um, you know, it's kind of turned into the, the term of the era. Um, but really what we're talking about is to solve issues, to solve problems in what is really the, one of the most complex systems that humanity has ever created. No one stakeholder group, one oh one community is going to do it by themselves. So the notion that you can pass a single law and solve security, the notion that you can create a standard that's going to you know, flip a switch somewhere and we're all going to trust this 
is not how you solve problems in this complex environment. But that's really hard for developing countries. If you have limited resources, your communities are newly online, you have a new, a different set of challenges than what we might be being discussed here in Washington. You want a way to bring those to the table that's valid, that's acceptable, and that is um, heard. And the ecosystem has to evolve to do that. And it's not an existential question, it's a very real question because you know, the growth space, if you look at the growth of the internet, it is in Asia, it's in Africa, and that is bringing demands on, on governance. An encouraging piece is to see um, things like the Internet Governance Forum at the global level really going to the local and national level. So you really start to see this dialogue, and we here at the Internet Society a lot from countries of, okay, we don't quite know how to do this, but we're committed to trying and we're committed to, you know, how do we call a multi-stakeholder meeting? I mean, it's never been done in our country before. Um, so that's really encouraging to, to hear and to see, and that's, um, as that matures, um, and it is maturing, those voices will um, put demands on on the global system, whether it's at the UN, whether it's at organizations that we work with, the IETF, ICANN, et cetera. Um, and we, I think, part of this global internet governance tussle, so to speak, is how to bring those voices in. And um, they will impact security, those the ideas about how this should be done. So um, it's important to, as we think about this conversation happening in this room, in this city, um, there's a global community having the same sets of discussions that are equally as relevant for the system. Great, thanks. So, Rick, I think you have to share that microphone with Sally. Um, from the corporate perspective, how is this going? I mean, I imagine you have to explain this at a pretty high level to people that think you're spending a lot of money going around talking to the same people, which might or might not be true. Um, <laughs> But from the uh, from the dialogue and the challenge of the multi-stakeholder versus multilateral versus, you know, how does this go forward? I mean, do you think that we're making progress? Are there areas we should be spending more time, less time? Sure. First of all, I want, I want to thank Tim Lorden for putting this on. Tim is, he doesn't get enough shout outs at this event and he's been doing this for years and he could sit on any one of these panels and have great insight, yet he has better discipline than most of us and doesn't. Um, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I want to thank Tim. And I also want to say, we're doing this in the museum. I think it's symbolic in of itself. I mean, this is a pillar of free speech. Um, I hope some of you, if you are new in town, get a chance to go downstairs and take a look because it's really amazing what they've put together here about newspapers and the information and, and what the future could be and what it's been in the past and also the limitations that have occurred um, in the past on free speech here in the United States as well. So we're not pure in all this um, as we go forward, but we try to do better um, as it's going, um, as we continue our, our efforts here. To your question, Shane, you know, that's one of the problems. One of the problems is there are so many forests out there. Um, Chris was talking about that a little bit, that you know, there's so many different avenues to get your point across. But it also creates forum shopping as well. Um, and it becomes very expensive. It's expensive for companies like ours who are wondering why, you know, you know second trip to Singapore or going to Brussels or wherever it happens to be um, somewhere in Africa or Asia. Um, it, it doesn't matter. We're traveling around. Um, and they said, well, what did you accomplish? And sometimes, thank goodness, nothing. Um, right. That was times, the goal. <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, and, and so it becomes very expensive. Um, Net Mundial um, was part of that. You know, it was sort of kind of seemed to us as, out, you know, as an outsider not involved in the organizing as something that was kind of thrown together. Um, it kind of worked out towards the end, but there wasn't a lot of direction. There wasn't a lot of transparency. Who has the pen? Um, you know, those are some things that are important. And on the OECD side and other, the WISIS plus 10, that's a whole nother category of areas that we have to focus on as a business. Um, and it becomes very complex. But the bottom line for all this is they're all interconnected. Language at the Net Mundial where, you know, some folks said the words don't matter, you know, as long as we get multi-stakeholder uh, out of the Brazilians, now, that's a great thing. Words matter because now it's become, you know, the Bible of the internet. And so it did matter. And thank goodness, you know, we, as a company spent the resources along with some other companies to have people down there on the ground. Because when you looked at the comments that came in prior to NetMundial, not one of those comments, at least from what I can tell, 
were ever included in any part of the principles. Now, it was the people on the ground who negotiated, and we had some great um, help from the U.S. government and others, but it, you had to be there. And Shane, I'm going to steal your line because I, I love it so much, which is the Internet is about inter, you know, connectivity and remote access, yet it's the only place where if you're not on the ground during the policy discussions, you know, you're left out. And so it becomes very expensive, and that's why we have raised concerns on the Net Mundial Initiative. You know, we're not clear what it is. Is, is it transparent? You know, what does it really mean? Um, is it another trip that we're going to have to take? How are the NGOs and civil society going to afford? And then it gets spun as a corporate event. Yet, I can tell you, I don't know any companies that I'm dealing with that have supported the Net Mundial Initiative. So I hate that it's termed a corporate because the World Economic Forum was involved. So there's things like that. And the more you have these events around the world, I think the more disperse the conversation gets. And that's why we're big supporters of the Internet Society, because they allow for a place where you can come together and have ideas and discussions and from the local level bring it up. And I was just at a, an event here in D.C. on Internet governance. And it, you can have those conversations. And I think we need more of that and then have that roll into the Internet governance form, where I hope everyone around here supports that and, and goes, and you have one place to go. So for us, it's incredibly complex. It's a bunch of acronyms. Trying to explain it to our executives um, sounds like we're just trying to justify our trips and our existence. But we, at a core, at a public policy level, know it's important. We know it's about the future of a company like ours, where our businesses are around the world, and our customers are growing by leaps and bounds, and we want to encourage it. But we need to ensure that we encourage that in a safe, secure, and sustainable internet. John, I saw you, but yeah. first, first I'm going to ask Mike a question, if you don't mind. Th th then we got, we're going to open the floor here. Mike, as somebody who represents startups, venture capitalists, people that are trying or hoping that a lot these billion users are going to be their client base at some point, how, how do you explain all of this? And is it just like a big digital utility that's going global, or does it make sense at a certain level, or do you just sort of a lot of them just, just choose to ignore it and say, you know, when, until it touches me, I don't care? Um, uh, that's a good question. I think um, uh, to most startups uh, on the other coast, uh, it, it's hard to say that this really matters to them. Um, you know, there are a lot of acronyms that are, are somewhat meaningless. You know, we hear about WISIS plus 10 and ICANN and the ITU and, and um, you know, I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, Chris has a lot more if you talk to him later. Uh, I, I learned stuff from him today. No, I no thank you. I thought you knew. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that it matters more to the people in this room than it matters to, uh, to the startup community. Um, they're much more outcome uh, oriented than process driven, and um, you know Washington is at least to a, a California outsider, extremely overly process driven. Um, with um, uh, you know where outcome is secondary. I know that uh, that may be. Um, I don't mean that to be uh, to come across negatively to Washingtonians, but. Um, <laughs> We're all paid in the room to have these dialogues, but we'd like to have a free and open expression of right, so, what so, people so think about you, us. Thank you for the invite. But um, uh, I think Rick just, said, Rick just said, if you're not on the ground during the policy, policy discussions, you're left out. And um, to a certain extent, that's true. What, what I think startups really want to get down to is um, you know, this, I, this, this phrase that keeps getting thrown around, which is permissionless innovation. They want to be able to create what they're creating and do what they want to do with kind of limited light touch oversight from you know, anybody from a, a, a local regulator to an international policy body. Um, uh, and and so, Shane, I'm not sure if that necessarily uh, answers your question, but, but ultimately um, the, the acronyms are somewhat meaningless. The outcome is, is really kind of what we're, uh, we're aiming to, uh, to get to. Um, because, you know, if, if you take any startup, um, most, sorry, most non-funded startups in, uh, in Silicon Valley, they're not going to be able to go to these conferences that most of the people on this panel attend. They can't do it. They don't have the resources. They don't have the staff. And quite frankly, they don't have the interest. Um, they just want to keep doing what they're doing. Got it. All right. John, you had some comments on the previous. Oh, yeah, it, was, it was just on the point about if you're not in the room, uh, you're not part of the process. Well, if you, if you take the Net Mundial statement as an example, 
convert it into a Word document from a PDF and then do a word search for the words child, children or youth, you will get no returns because those words do not appear anywhere in the document. And also, rather surprisingly, the word the rights of disabled people appear about six or seven times. Now, what I conclude from this is there were some very good lobbyists present at the Net Mondial, Net Mondial meeting uh, arguing on behalf of uh, the disability interest groups and fair play to them and good luck to them and I'm glad they succeeded but we weren't there because we didn't have the budgets uh, uh, to, to be able to fly to Brazil. I'm very sad about that by the way for more than one reason <laughs> but we were, we were simply not there and so kids and kids interest value. Now that doesn't mean everybody else in the room was evil and wicked and didn't care about kids. Absolutely not. Not all uh, Everybody of else was in the room. <laughs> well some. maybe some of them did. Right. But, uh, but people go to these meetings to advance the interest that they represent at them. So if you're not, that interest group is not there, then they can be very, very heavily uh, marginalized. So when people use the word community, I think they should put inverted commas around it because it, it's not really a community in the sense that I think most people who are not involved in the internet space would understand it. So, so I just wanted to comment on something. Sure, go ahead. That, uh, so I think part of the, the challenge is for, especially for companies and, and other stakeholders who can't go to all these meetings, and they can't, is making sure there's a cross-pollination of these various different communities, including the communities that you were talking about, but also to bring it down to earth of why this actually matters, not just talking about the, the higher level concepts, uh, for instance, when we talk about multi-stakeholder and what that means, but why that actually matters, for instance, to your your issue of permissionless innovation, why it's going to have an effect on the business models of these companies, why it's going to have an economic effect both in the United States and in developing countries around the world. One of the big pushes that we, we've been doing is more capacity building with those countries, and I think they're very interested in the economic argument, for instance. What I've seen in the last, you know, especially the last few years, is a transition among senior policymakers in government and in the private sector where you used to talk about these issues and their eyes would glaze over and they didn't really understand and they said the technical guy should deal with this, to one where they understand it at the government level as a real economic policy issue, a real human rights policy issue, a real national security issue, as Sony illustrated. Uh, but then, but then you know, for us, a foreign policy issue and for you, I think, a business issue. So I think maybe uh, really grounding this in what is going to be at stake, what the choices we're making now are going to lead to if we don't really defend the system we have, what does a divided internet mean or a balkanized internet mean, and what's that going to mean for business. I do think we have an obligation to translate that a little bit and work with those communities to get them interested. I but, see that But happening. Shane, I think inadvertently we've uh, in put our finger on one of the crucial issues here, and uh, something John said triggered it for me, which is too often these discussions involve uh, self-selection, right? It's not a representative uh, population. So how do you make this more representative, right? Being present at one of these things should not be the way you get your agenda done. It's not representative. And so that's a fundamental threat to the legitimacy of this multi-stakeholder model. There are competing models for governance, you know, that are more representative we may not like them, but they're more representative. And that's, I think, the emerging tension here, is that you're going to have what's been a largely self-selecting Western group facing challenges from that non-Western population. So how do you deal with that? Well, so I, I just say that there are big opportunities for the non-Western world to play a much larger role, and even the institutions that are there, ICANN and other institutions out there. And I think if they start seeing those as opportunities rather than challenges, I think they can really have both their government and their private sector and their civil society, particularly among the larger countries, who can really, I think, play at a very high level in this. And I think that's another challenge that we need to meet. Um, you know, Roger Cuchetti, um talked about when ICANN first started, the lack of interest by governments. Um, they didn't care, they didn't think it would go forward. The internet was just a, a passing fancy. Um, I was at the U.S. Chamber at that time, and my, I was point on ICANN um, for the business community, and the same could be said then. It's, it's really no different than what you were saying before about small businesses. They don't care. The problem sometimes with the multi-stakeholder community is that you can have somebody from the U.S. Chamber there who is representing small businesses, but their vote is one compared to another person who represents themselves, and their vote is one. So you're, you are being represented at some of these events, but you don't have, there's no, 
mechanism to show what weight is being carried by that, to, to your point. Um, and sometimes governments have that role, right? They are the representative, you know, elected, hopefully elected representatives of other people. Sometimes they're not. And that's where the negativity of government in getting involved in the internet, when governments are abusing their roles. Um, but a lot of times what we should be encouraging, and I think one of the negative comments that have happened over the past several years is government has no role. And so we keep telling these new and developing countries that you don't have a role. And what they come back and say, oh, yes, we do. And we're going to show you the role we have. And we end up in a, I think, worse position. I think we have to learn how to combine the roles of government doing the right thing with business organizations and civil society who represent groups themselves. And they're not just individuals. And bring that together and say there is an important role for each and every stakeholder here. And understanding who they are representing. And, and just to be clear, we have never said governments have no role. No. We say, depending on the subject, governments may have a lesser or greater role, but governments may not have the final role, depending on what you're right. talking and about. And then it gets into, once we cross over from a technical standard discussion that ICANN once was, um, and the internet, and, the inter you know, and, and how we're going to connect all the different uh, servers and routers to public policy, there is a whole new group of interests that came in, including governments. And we have to recognize that, but also educate them on how what has been successful and what has not. And, and really start working together instead of this, as I said, out there. When I'm at the IGF, I hear you know government has no role from a very large group of folks out there. And I think, well, yes, they do yeah. protect children to protect consumers from harm. And just I know Shane wants to move on, but I think that's really the, <laughs> crucial, <laughs> the crucial issue for us, which is we've got a global governance model developed in the 1990s and based in some ways on the thinking that was prevalent in the 1990s. Now it has to adjust. Now it has to change. And part of that change is the role of government will shift, if only because all the other governments in the world have agreed there are borders in cyberspace, national sovereignty applies. How do we accommodate this new set of actors who might argue um, that they are more representative of their populations than the existing multi-stakeholder model. If you were to walk up and ask someone in China, who would you rather have representing you, the Chinese government or these guys you don't know, um, I think I know what the answer would be. Sally, did you want to turn any comment on that? Okay. So actually, well, I want to, John, I want to go back to you because what's interesting is you actually represent the area that probably has the capability to, I mean, most people, when you bring up children, mm. kind of all the technical persuasion about I can't do this, you know, rights, this, this, and that, m most of the time kind of fall away and people want to get cooperative and say, how do we help to solve that problem? And I don't know if there's any lessons learned. I realize that's not a 100% statement. You still have issues, you know, here in the United States around First Amendment. But we, um, you know, are there any th things that we should be thinking about that bring more people to the table that get away from some of the edge issues that separate us? Well, the revelations of Mr. Snowden have certainly not helped this discussion, uh, particularly for the, the big US-based companies who are trying to put more and more space between themselves and any uh, agencies or arms of government. And cooperation with the police and so on has got more difficult, uh, not easier as a result. I may, may, that may pass, it may pass, but certainly right now where I'm sitting, that's what I see. Um, I mean, there, there's... If I had a pound for every, and by the way, that's about $1.6 uh, <laughs> I checked before I bought my iPod Nano, Nano here the other day. Um, <laughs> um, if I had a pound for every time I'd heard governments and different people pledge to harmonize laws and so on and so forth to try and deal with the challenges of cyberspace, I'd probably be on a yacht in the Bahamas. No, I wouldn't be on a yacht in the Bahamas. I wouldn't miss this for the world. But uh, the, the concrete reality, however, is, is quite different. Um, and the US is a, a, a classic example. I mean, for example, in my country and most countries in Europe, uh, give you a practical illustration. Uh, it's a question of fact for a jury whether or not a particular image uh, can be said to be child pornographic. Uh, obviously, a judge has to decide whether it's capable of being construed as being child pornography, but ultimately, it's simply a question of fact. 
for a jury to determine. In the United States, following the decision in uh, the Supreme Court in Ashcroft and the Free Speech Coalition, it's necessary in principle at any rate to prove that the, the, the person depicted in the image is in fact a real child and the things being done to the child in the image did in fact actually happen. Now in Britain, and as I say in most countries in Europe, if we see an image that looks like child pornography, we simply accept that it is child pornography. And as long as a, ju a jury can agree that in, in, as a matter of fact, it, it could be child pornography, that's an end to it. Now that's, you know, when the police who are, who are cooperating much more closely with each other, transnationally, building up Hashes, databases of hashes of images, they're having to separate out, separate out those images which the, the US police can't prove were done to real children but because, uh, be and therefore they're not strictly speaking child pornography, pornography under US federal law from those images which, which we, you know, in the UK it wouldn't matter one way or the other. And that remains a, a practical obstacle. And that kind of thing, I'm afraid, even in an area like child pornography where, <coughs> where as you say, you would imagine there would be no difficulties whatsoever between governments and police forces around the world coming together to agree on a set of girls. It's not actually happening and it's certainly not happening at anything like the speed it should be happening. You bring up an interesting point, which is if you agree on all the, the rules of law, kind of the ground points there, there generally is cooperation. The challenge is, you know, we may be going out of our way, it feels like, to to defend a bunch of scumbags, but the, the rule of law in that particular country just doesn't think they're quite guilty at that point. Yeah. Um, and I think we're, we're struggling with that in, in a lot of space. And actually, Chris, that may be where in the cyber area, are you, you seeing more agreement around, you know, what what is, I mean, I, I, in, in obviously the Sony case is a very interesting one of, you know, w we don't have a lot of doctrine in this area of, you know, when, when do we get a challenge and push back and say, hey, you stepped over this line. Um, yeah. You know, and, and especially, and what's interesting about the Sony case is it's corporate too. I mean, it's not another government that we're necessarily dealing with. We're, yeah, we're not clear completely on that. Yet. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the Sony case certainly highlighted a number of things. It was a, it was a destructive attack mm -hmm. launched, you know, violating the sovereignty of the United States against a company in that case, but it was coupled with an attempt to uh, keep people from expressing their freedom of expression mm -hmm. rights, and it was also coupled with physical threats. And I think you saw governments around the world condemning that, not just President Obama, but many other governments came out with statements saying that that kind of conduct was unacceptable. And so I think that's important. And I do think there are some, some uh, governments who in the past have said that there are no rules for cyberspace. Cyberspace is this entirely different thing that's not subject to the rules of the physical world, which is frankly nuts, uh, that you, know, you really do have to ground that in the physical world. And, and, and you have to unpack this issue uh, a little bit in my, in my view so that you can I think engender much better cooperation against shared threats. I think that's something that we've been doing a lot of. The Sony case, to me, I think really raised the awareness of a lot of people of this being something that's just not a technical issue again, but could affect human rights, could affect companies. You know, Jim said that a lot of uh, countries are saying that sovereignty applies in cyberspace. Yes, but it doesn't mean you can draw a sovereign border around your space for all purposes. You still have international accepted human rights, free, rights of free flow of information. Oh, that's uh, a different thing. And so, but, 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 it is, but it's an important distinction because it doesn't mean governments really get away with saying that they control everything within their, their borders. So, so what we're doing on, on that front is a number of different things. One as you unpack these issues in the cyber crime area, there's been a lot of work to have much better international cooperation against these threats. I, you know, I've been doing, that's where I started doing this 22 years ago, and I'd say it's far, far better now in terms of cooperative networks. We have the Budapest Cyber Crime Treaty, which, you know, true, not everyone accepts, but many, many new governments are signing on to it, and even those that are not are emulating its provisions. So even if you don't have a harmonization of law, at least you have a common set of frameworks to work with. We have, uh, we've been working in Gymnos as well in something called the UN Group of Government Experts to say that international law applies in cyberspace just like it does in the physical world. Things like the law of armed conflict at the very high level, the UN Charter. And the UN Human Rights Commission, we got a resolution saying you have the same rights online as you do offline. Not surprising to anyone on this panel, but actually, you know, was a big deal to get that, that uh, agreement. Uh, and then more recently, we've been working on what are the norms below that high threshold of armed conflict that we want to uh, get states to, to adopt, and things like attacking critical infrastructures, cooperative measures when you see things coming from your borders, not attacking certs. 
and we're getting a lot of take up in the international community on, on this set of norms, trying to create a more safe and stable cyberspace coupled with better confidence building measures between states. So there's a lot of uh, good activity underway. And all those are somewhat interrelated, but they also are separate. And I think we're making some real progress in terms of creating this better uh, uh, cooperative framework against these threats, while at the same time trying to preserve the, the openness we have. The one example I'll give you is uh, uh, about a year and a half ago now, we had attacks on denial of service attacks against a lot of our financial institutions. And what we did was, uh, you know, our technical people re uh, reached out, our certs reached out. These were botnets, so they were all over the world. They were concentrated in Germany and Japan and China, everywhere. Uh, they reached out, our law enforcement people reached out, but then we diplomatically did diplomatic demarches, which before I came to the State Department, <laughs> that always seemed like a real nasty thing, but you can have a positive demarche, and we asked them for cooperation and help, and we got a lot of cooperation, and that kind of builds this norm of better cooperation and uh, against these shared threats out there. Uh, so we have to make progress in all of these different arenas. We need to keep the conversation somewhat separate so they don't bleed over, but understand how they interrelate. And, and I do agree that child pornography is an important issue, but I do think we made a lot of progress toward that. And even if there are differences, there are always going to be differences. And we can't, and we're never going to get one ring that rules them all. We're not <coughs> going to have one big UN institution that, is that decides all the rules of the game here. We have to work in a distributed manner. Just so we're clear, because Mike's going to report this all back to the other coast. So we're not going to get a cyberspace uh, license that his clients need to get to be able to do things. I think you're, you're, you're cool for now, but, you know, I, I keep in watching the, in us. In the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's nothing better than asking for permission, I think, 150 times <laughs> or whatever. But, um, but maybe we can get closer to maybe 149. <laughs> you never know. All right. We've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to open it to the floor in the back there. I don't, know, I don't think we've got another microphone, so talk loudly. Scott Smith, Department of State. So governments tend to codify norms in laws and between them in treaties. Companies use contracts in this multi-stakeholder model as for developing norms and culture. What kind of form might it take uh, without prejudice to And We will be grading your answer. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, that is, you, your point, what, one of the points that you make is, I think, a good one. We've heard this before, which is, you know, there, there's sovereignty, right? There's different rule of law in different countries. And that's why I think sometimes the term free flow of information is very misleading because it really is what I like to term the seamless flow of information because you're going to have differences of law. So sometimes it will be treaties, it will be trade agreements, it could be contracts. Um, you look at the EU uh, safe harbor, um, privacy safe harbor between the U.S. and the EU, and obviously there's ongoing discussions on that, but when it first was created, it was a contract, right? Companies signed contracts and said they would follow certain rules um, with consumer data and with uh, their employee data. So it's a combination of all the, all the above, but it really is a seamless flow because you're going to have differences. You're going to have sovereignty, and you're going to have um, areas where there just isn't going to be agreement, so you try to minimize those, and that's really the goal, to minimize the friction as much as possible, understanding that governments are going to want to have their ability to protect their citizens and have their own cultural norms. I also, I mean, I think part of the challenge in that question is that you're not going to end up with a single one, right? And, and it's part of what you're hearing here is that there's a role for law in certain cases. There's a role for simple technical cooperation, which we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate in this whole governance discussion where we're talking about governments and governance and states and laws and all that. The, the actual cooperative nature of um, technical development and evolution um, is, is truly profound and is, is sometimes not uh, something you can codify directly. But it's the thing that allows that permissionless innovation output to occur. And so when you're looking for what's the right output, one of the things you want to keep in mind, I think, is what are the things you're trying to maintain? What are the things you want to endure? Uh, laws and treaties can tend uh, to be more difficult to modify over time. And so you want to use those appropriately. Um, but you, you know, this technology, you know, the idea, you know, today there was a statement of, um, from the FTC on Internet of Things. I mean, this is not something you would have anticipated 
you know, certain years ago, and you want to make sure that the, the policy tools that you use are um, equal to the task that you're, you have at hand. It may be laws, it may be simple cooperation, it may be something in between. For best practices. Right. 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 And, and there are some things that states will do for their domestic purposes, right. like cyber crime laws, and we want them all to be at least compatible and interoperable. But we don't think there should be some global treaty for the Internet. I don't even know what that means. Uh, I don't know how that's reached. I don't know who the Lifetime parties are. Uh, <laughs> because we're really in the beginning of this conversation, and there are other stakeholders involved, and not just governments in a lot of these issues. And even when we're talking about uh, issues like the norms I talked about, what are the, the appropriate norms of behavior, we're in the beginning of that conversation, not the end of that mm -hmm. conversation. And the analogy I often draw is to something called the Proliferation Security Initiative, where you, what you did is you really had a group of large tent like-minded governments that grew over time and uh, if governments were outside of that or if actors were outside of that large consensus then those governments can act in a concerted way to enforce whatever those norms are. We're not close to that yet but if you think about some really acceptable norms that the countries around the world can, can uh, agree to Things like not, you know, for instance, uh, or cooperating uh, in terms of activity that they're seeing from their borders or not attacking critical infrastructures, as an example. Those are things where you can build a consensus over time. Rather than try to impose some sort of treaty, I think it's better to draw that consensus and grow that consensus, you know, over a few years. And we're beginning that conversation now, and I think that will be a productive way to look, uh, look at it and also gives you the flexibility that you were talking about because we'll see new challenges and we'll see new items that come up over time. And so here's, a, here's a prediction for you. Um, we're going to see changes and it'll go this way. Uh, the role, the relative share of influence of governments in this process will increase. The relative share of geeks will decrease. That's the trend we're going to see. And it's kind of inevitable and I'm happy to bet anyone a ton of kimchi that this is where we'll be in uh, five years. How that will work out, how that will work out, we don't know. But that's that's what we're seeing happening. Is we've had a, the incumbents are staging, uh, the incumbent power holders. I'll be a Marxist for a minute. The incumbent <laughs> power holders are staging kind of a defensive battle, right? We we run this thing and we don't want to give it up. And here's all these reasons why you shouldn't. And, and I'm not sure it's the best place to be. I mean, from a tactical perspective, that kind of defense doesn't necessarily work. You want to put forward an alternate vision. What does an internet look like that's multi-stakeholder and free and open and preserves democratic values but accommodates the wishes and the desires and expectations of the non-Western population? Although I don't think that's a dynamic that at least I'm seeing. What I, what I think we're seeing is that community, and again, disaggregating all these issues so we're into talking about the technical working of the internet versus some of the policy issues. I see that community saying we need to be more inclusive. We need to have more people involved, other countries involved, and that's a big part of our policy. Tell me where you want the kimchi delivered. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, I, I think that, that Mike's, Mike's community in many ways, if we can take this, he was representing the startup community, right, is, is really an, an additional pressure on that, that model, right, of, or push, pushback of that governance approach where more government um, activity. I mean, we, you know, gover you, you think about the fact that, you know, I, all of us, many of us anyway, have multiple devices. We are interacting with this technology in a way we didn't before um, just a couple years ago. And we as end users, I mean, I, I have this conversation now with my mother about, you know, what's the balance between her expectations of security and her expectations of privacy. And she's thinking about that. So, I mean, I, I do think that this, this yes, there's going to be expectations of government, and I think we're seeing a lot of potential government overreach now as a result. You know, every, we're kind of more one crisis away from, you know, government lurching into action at any moment. But it's in part the, the, this, this new community coming online and the innovation cycle coming out of communities like the startup crowd in the U.S. but elsewhere that are going to continue to hopefully push back. Maybe that's a naive view, and I'm not sure about the kimchi promise, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think uh, governments are, and the consequences of overreach in this space are, are pretty profound. But there, there are examples of technology overcoming those overreaches yeah. also. So, you know, there's this, this uh, app called FireChat that was used in the Hong Kong uh, protests that 
um, helped overcome the blocking of other services. So there are some examples, some good examples, where uh, you know technology and innovation over, have overcome some sort of, of uh, state or government hurdles. Um, but you know the the less of those we can have, and the more true the the, the multi-stakeholder process can be, where it's not just you know, a handful of stakeholders, but a true multi-stakeholder process. And I think the Internet Society has some local chapters also that allow for greater participation. But there's got to be a way to kind of um, uh, uh, entice people, with, aside from maybe kimchi, um, <laughs> to participate, because that may not be enough. Um, to, to get people across that line or that one time where the governance model goes too far and and the idea can't get launched where the where the where the cost benefit ratio gets out of whack you know where you can't launch the fire chat equivalent and that's I think gonna push you know and that we shouldn't lose sight in this whole governance discussion we've talked about various right. stakeholders right <laughs> The users, you know, don't don't underestimate that. You know, it's an amorphous <laughs> group of people. It sounds, you know, but you can't underestimate the power that 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 can have on policymaking. We've seen it in the United States. But as your bookie, I advise you: just because you love a horse doesn't mean it's going to win the race. That's right. And cool. in this case, I know which the fastest horse is, and it ain't the guys we're talking about now. I look at it a little differently because I think it's an expanding pie. I think you are seeing both government getting more involved, but you're also seeing citizens getting more involved. I think it's a, it's a growth area. I mean, now with discussions at the ITU or the UN and other places where it really was just government to government, they are seeking input. I know our own State Department does that. They go around and listen to people and try to get ideas, and, and, so I, and more and more people are showing up to those meetings. And so I think it's really kind of an expanding. I don't know where it ends up, if I, you know, who's going to win. But I don't think it's a zero-sum game that governments are going this way and, and consumers and others are going another. I think it's great that there's more participation in this to get a lot of great ideas on what's best, again, to create what all of us want is a safe, secure, and sustainable Internet um, going forward. So I, I'd say uh, Jim may not be the best handicapper of forces necessarily, but uh, uh, but I would say that I think part of the real part of you know where this is going to be made, where the real challenge lies, and where we really need to concentrate a lot of our efforts, is not just in this room and talking to ourselves and talking to the people in the U.S. <coughs> who believe this, but a lot of the international work, particularly with the developing world. I mean, I, I think that you have a lot of the developing world who, you know who talks about some of these issues, but sometimes it's a proxy for things they need, and we need to be able to address those things, whether they're in cybercrime, whether they're in technical assistance, <coughs> uh, whether they're uh, in capacity building, but also bring them into the conversation and help them develop their own multi-stakeholder processes, and some of these countries don't have a, a, a tradition of doing that. So, and that's the business community's job as well as the government's job and civil society's job. So. So I think that's where the real, you know, that's where things are going to really be decided. That's why I think Net Monday All was so important, that we need to continue to work with that community, whether it's in, uh, the, you know, in our hemisphere or it's in uh, Africa, where we've done a lot of work. I think that's really where we're going to have to concentrate efforts, because th they want to be on the right side of this. They want to have the economic growth and innovation, and we need to make sure that they understand what's at stake. But there's, there's a word we haven't mentioned. I'll just say this really quickly, and that word is democratic. How do we get a democratic governance system? What we have now is not democratic. How do we, ch I want a democratic internet governance system. And yes, that means other countries will be challenged more than we are, but that should be a goal. Sorry. No, 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 no problem. I was just uh, thinking about developing countries a little bit. You know, we're in a global economy now. And, um, you know, when with these developing countries, they want products and services and platforms. We have products and services and platforms we can offer as long as they have a way to um, uh, deliver those platforms to the people. So I know that there are things developing countries want, um, and there's got to be a way to find some sort of happy medium to help them get access, more broadband, uh, probably wireless, I suppose. Um, and um, that's a conversation that, that's also kind of very interesting. How do we bridge that, that divide and that gap? Well, and I would say they, they want access to the products and services. They also want access to the innovation cycle to create the products and services themselves. Um, and, and that's the real 
challenge of if you can create something in your local economy, in your local environment, a technology solution that's relevant, and it's happened. There's been some amazing things. Ushaidi is one that comes to mind. There are others. Um, can you deploy them globally? Can you, uh, sitting in Kenya, get an application out to the global internet, to the global community, get a user base, get a customer base? Do the laws of Kenya and the world enable that to happen? So it's both access to the technology, but also access to the innovation potential. I was at a conference in China, and I'll just, this is a good story, because the, one of the speakers was the Ministry of, uh, Minister of Communications, I think from uh, Tanzania, and his opening remarks were, I'd like to thank the government of China for building our broadband network uh, in, in Tanzania. And it cost them $350 million in loans, whatever the China equivalent of the, the you know, the trade loan thing is, they, that's, they just gave them the money. So we are seeing all this engagement with the development world, but it's not just us. There's other people, and that's going to shape um, how this debate moves along. I, Tanzania is using, if I got the country right, might have been Ghana, um, they're using a Chinese network given to them by the government of China. That's not the world we're talking about here today. Yeah, but that, that's also <coughs> linking it. I think we have tremendous opportunities. You know, we've seen these security challenges like the mm -hmm. Sony attack, which has raised, you know, I, I, there's a lots of governments around the world that want help with developing policies, developing laws, as they are now getting broadband access, as they're getting cable drops. But this is where we don't necessarily, sh we shouldn't silo our activities. When we're giving them that help, or we're working with them in that area, we're also trying to advance this larger suite of policy issues, and I think we can do that, that will help them understand why we're actually trying to help them, and we're not against them. Uh, so I think there are cross opportunities here we have to look at, too. And it's not just about building their broadband network, although that's obviously important, and they care about that, but it's also what other things we can offer them and work with them on. So is and it a problem that China built and broadband, are we worried? What is it we're concerned about there? I mean, China also builds really large runways to get bauxite out of Tanzania. I think And I have a cell phone probably thanks to that. So you've got countries now that it's kind of like, what would you call it, New Dawn? That's, that's a political joke. Let's call it <laughs> New Dawn. That's a Greek joke. Um, <laughs> people have sort of woken up and said, you know what? Just, just because this is how it used to work, it doesn't have to work this way anymore. And I would see that in the in Net Mundial was kind of that to some extent. Uh, the Indians see that, the, the Chinese, maybe even the Germans. Just because it worked this way before doesn't mean I can't reshape it. How do I build influence? How do I get those votes in the IT, <coughs> the UN or some other organization? Well, giving somebody a broadband network is a good way to shape their internet policy. Anybody else want to comment on that? I don't disagree with you. I just thought it was an interesting question. Do we still have a question over here, Michelle? Or do we answer it? By the way, Scott, we're still answering the question that you asked, and you left yeah. the room. I want you to know I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best question ever asked. Everybody got an A, by the way. Yeah. Only, only questions that can be answered yes or no. For no. <laughs> there are lots of ways of influencing countries and working yeah. with countries, and, and I don't think it's limited to building that their networks. I think there are lots of things that the U.S. can and should <laughs> offer, not just the government again, but the private sector and others, and we do. A lot of our capacity building efforts in Africa, and we've done a lot of this, have been focused on giving them you know, better policy and other capabilities to deal with threats, to deal with some of the challenges that they're facing, and to work with them. And I think there's a big appetite for that. So let's not, you know, let's not belittle that either. I think that's part of the policy. Well, and, and not just us, but <laughs> other Yeah, I was going to say, and let's not overestimate the power of big powers to formulate local positions. I think, you know, local positions are driven by a myriad of <laughs> interests. Some of them, you know, from U.S. influence, some of them maybe from Chinese influence, but plenty from the influence of their local economy, their local history. I mean, can't tell you how many countries come forward and say, I've got a very clear position on you know, free speech, and it goes back because of decades and decades of you know, history that we bring to this, difficult, hard history to that issue. And so I, I think, you know, yes, there's influence and then there's, there's you know, countries are quite capable of, of understanding their own interests. So, yeah, that plays both ways. But I think, you know, it is, it's a competitive game in a way it wasn't before. And that's maybe one of the big changes yeah. in Internet governance is there's more, there's new players, there's more players, they're non-Western players, and, and they want different things. And so it's a competitive game 
that we aren't necessarily used to, and maybe some of the existing institutions don't don't yet know how to accommodate that. So that's why I expect we're going to see changes just inevitably. So as I promised you, this was not going to be a discussion about IANA. Um, and actually, we, we have to clear the room. We have one more panel here. The next one's actually digital protectionism. Are the US companies facing an overseas backlash? <laughs> so those of you who are concerned about Jim's question, you might want to stay in the room. But I want to thank all our panelists for a very good, lively discussion and a lot of things to think about.